My name is Sumaira Siddihi, and I am a Nissa volunteer. I manage the Transition Home and Nissa Home Shelter. I look for the client's needs there. So I am here today to give you a brief presentation about Nissa and to bring awareness to the domestic violence issue in our community. So the objective of uh, Nissa is to provide, promote domestic harmony through Islamic values education, prevention, and peaceful intervention. So domestic violence uh, and emotional abuse are behaviors used by one person in a relationship to take control. Domestic violence occurs when there is a power imbalance in relationships. Violence can be criminal, include physical assault, like hitting, shoving, pushing, sexual abuse, and stalking. All the emotional and psychological and financial abuse, and nowadays social media abuse, are not criminal behaviors, but they can lead to criminal violence. Next one. So some um, DV statistics in US. So according to CDC, 41% of women and 26% of men have experienced intimate partner violence in their lifetime. This includes physical violence, sexual violence, or stalking. Nearly three in 10 women and one in 10 men in the US have experienced physical violence or stalking. One in four children witnessed intimate partner violence in the state. In 2000, women against family abuse reported that the rate of domestic violence in Muslim community is about as same as in general population, about 80%. It tends to, however, be more hidden. And October is a Domestic Violence Month, hence we are here to provide you awareness about that. DV in Muslim community in North America. Domestic violence relies for the Muslim community in North America are generally influenced by the percentage of immigrants all over the world with their unique dynamics that exist within each ethnic and cultural community. Immigrant women often feel trapped in abusive relationships because of immigration laws, language barriers, social isolation, and lack of financial resources. Immigrant women often come from culture that accept domestic violence or because they have less access to legal and social services in US cities. Battered immigrant women are less likely to have certified interpreter in court when reporting complaints to the police or 911 operator, or even when seeking information about the rights and the legal system. Facts and figures about DV violence in Muslim community are not as up to date as we would hope. So we wish we didn't have to, but due to community need and due to this issue in our community, in 2002, Nisa was founded. The object was to have a safe haven for the women and children where they can, they not only feel safe, but they, are, they learn how to be independent. In 2003, Helpline was launched. So we do have an 800 number where, peop, where clients can call nine to seven, seven days a week. And after hours, they can leave a voicemail message. Their calls are being answered by trained advocates and they take the calls and they start the healing process as the call is taken. They guide the clients about resources, safety planning, and what the next step should be if they are in a dangerous situation. In 2004, outreach community started. 2009, we, uh, our, our shelter became, become operational and we started to host clients in our own shelter. 2019, we purchased a transition home where we can have clients long term until they are ready to go out of the world being an independent person. 2020 transition home was operational and 2021, due to the need of our clients, we hired staff. So in this 20 years, you can see from 2022 till today, Nisa has grown. Again, this is something that we wish we didn't, but we have, because of the issues still going on, 
is growing and the needs of the clients are increasing. Next. So some of the services that we provide are one, the biggest one for us is the helpline, the 800 number. Case management. So from the time the clients come to us, we have a dedicated advocate helping them out through their process, through the whole process, not only supporting them with their case management, but also guiding them and providing them tools to become independent, to gain back their self-esteem. We have legal assistance. We provide them legal assistance. We guide them and connect them to lawyers. We have that emergency shelter and transition home where they can live with their children in most of the cases in a peaceful, safe environment. We do provide them financial assistance. Sometimes we have clients who just have the clothes that they are wearing. They have nothing with them when they come to us. So we give them everything that they needed and, they provide, and then provide them financial assistance until they are ready to be on their own. Translation services, so based on our community with different ethnic backgrounds, we have uh, advocates who can speak multiple languages. Mental health, TV abuse is a big emotional and psychological issue. It impacts not only the victim, but also the children. So we do provide mental health services to them. And then self-development. Our mission is not only to provide them a safe place. Our mission is to make them empowered, make them independent and so they can go out in the world and live. Next one. So some of the assistance that we have provided to our clients at both Nessa Home and Transition Home are monthly groceries that include meat and produce, guest gift cards, uh, personal care and toiletries. As I mentioned, they come with nothing sometimes. During Ramadan, we give them uh, Ramadan groceries, uh, Friday iftars, new Eid clothes. So we try to have our clients and their kids as normal of an environment as they can, keeping with their dignity and honor intact. We give them Eid gift cards so they can buy whatever they like for their kids or for themselves. We do Eid celebrations for our clients. Um, the board join us on our Eid dinners. We give toys for the kids, blankets and winter clothes. During school session, we provide them with backpacks and school supplies, school clothes and shoes. Some clients, when they come, they don't know how to drive. So we do have Uber rides for them or uh, guide them to take driving classes uh, so they can be independent when they are looking for jobs. The clients that are, um, once the whole process is done and they are ready to move out, we do help them setting up their homes with furniture on, and home goods. Uh, some clients come to us with infants or little children, so we supply formulas and diapers to them. And then again, like I said, we try to make their stay as pleasant as we can based on that stressful situation uh, that they are going through in their life. We do summer picnics and some outings for them. Next one. So clients that we have supported in the past few years, so in 2022, we have nine clients with seven kids. In 2023, 11 clients with six kids. And in 2024, six clients with 10 kids in our emergency shelter. Then in our, in our transition home, we had six adults with eight kids, six adults with five kids. And in 2024, nine adults with 11 kids. So pretty full house at both places. Next one. And then we received 380 calls on our helpline in 2023. 474 calls in 2024. So that's 1.3 calls every day. So there are some misconceptions about domestic violence. It does happen in religious families. It does happen to educated people. It not only happened to women, uh, men are also the victims. It's not gender specific. Both can be perpetrators. 
it not only, it does happen to women in all grades and standards. Working women, uh, educated women, rich women, there is no, no distinction. Um, it does not always include physical violence, emotional abuse, financial abuse, spiritual abuse is also very prominent. The victim is never the provoker. And drugs and alcohol are not always the case. And uh, uh, most of uh, the victims believe that, you, uh, so US legal system does support the immigrant victims. They don't have to be a citizen to um, use those uh, services. Some of the warning signs that you can look into the victims are that they, uh, they, they might be physical signs. You can see bruises and stuff. Or when, they, uh, when the abuser or partner is closed, they seem to be afraid. They, they, don't, they act differently in front of the abuser. And uh, they are very different when that person is not in front of them. Or they cannot make their own decisions um, because they, are never, they never had that opportunity to make decisions, so they will not make even a simple decision. They have no control on financial uh, decisions. Uh, they are very apologetic or meek because they are always afraid that if they did something wrong, they will have some kind of a response back in um, physical abuse or verbal abuse. They lost, uh, they have very low self-esteem. They are depressed and fearful. They seem detached and dissociated. They, were, they will not join the gatherings or events or parties. So these are some signs that you can kind of detect who is going through um, DV violence. So how you can get involved? One, share about NISA with your family and friends. So thank you, MCC, for inviting us to bring awareness. You can donate professional services. We are always looking for lawyers, doctors, therapists. So if you have those qualifications, please do join us. Uh, become a volunteer. You can help us with different things. Reach out to us, and then we will tell you how you can help us. Invite Nisa to present in your home and masjid like we are here today. Attend, public, uh, attend and publicize Nisa events. So if you are not aware, next week, uh, Sunday, October 13th, there is a NISA fundraising and annual banquet at Chani, and Ustada Husai will be giving the keynote address. So make sure that you buy the tickets and join us. Um, donate, your, uh, donate your contributions are 100% tax deductible. NISA is 501c charity, so you can claim the donations. And we are not only looking for monetary donations. As I mentioned in my previous slide, you can give us gift cards. <laughs> Those are more than welcome for stores like Walmart, Target, Foodmax, Uber Rides, Amazon, any of those things that helps us to provide those to their clients and they can buy whatever they need. And then add NISA to your will or state planning if you can. So this slide will introduce some of our board members that, uh, that uh, are supporting NISA and making this organization work, and also a list of NISA advocates. And I mentioned that our advocates are trained, fully trained and certified. They speak multiple languages, so we can cater to communities or people who are not English speaking. So we have different advocates, some who can speak Dari, Persian, Urdu, um, yeah. Next one. So some of our biggest NISA supporters that support us on an ongoing basis is Ikna Relief, Salam Food Pantry, um, Rewire Community, a Baraka Project, Rahima Foundation, and uh, MCC East Bay. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> okay, so um, that was my presentation for today. And um, I am here, and we have some board members here. So if there are any questions that you would like to ask, you are more than welcome to ask us about any further uh, clarification or concern if you have.
Okay, so um, the question that come in was, what is the difference between NISA home and transition home? So NISA home is a shelter, it's an emergency shelter. So when we receive a call that someone is uh, in a dangerous situation and they need to leave that uh, right away, we bring them to the shelter. So that is, most of our clients in the shelter are in a very different emotional state. They, they were just going through all those trauma. So we brought them there and um, it, uh, start supporting them. Transition home is when they pass that stage and now they are ready to go out in the world. So they either they are, they are taking classes or they already start working, but they still need some time to be fully on their own. So transition home is a little bit of a longer stay for them. So they can stay to be prepared to go out by themselves. We still support them, but not as close monitoring as we do to the clients in the shelter. Yeah, and just as um, Sister Samira said, the transition home is actually uh, made up of multiple units, separate units. It's like a little apartment complex. So each client, a vic domestic violence victim, has their own unit. So they're self-sufficient. They're cooking for themselves. They're paying their electricity bills. They're taking out their garbage. Whereas the house is a communu communal living where food is provided. Those amenities are provided. So the idea is that they're learning to be independent as if they're living in their own apartment and responsible and have those obligations. So which better equips them um, to be independent. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Actually, I have two questions. The first question is like, is this only for the Muslim brother sister or it's open to everyone? So I should have said that. So currently we are only supporting women and children, but for women, it's not just Muslim. We do have uh, a, a women come to us from different uh, religion or ethnicities, but right now it's just for women. But uh, I know as I was saying, it's not a good thing where we are growing their different needs. So we are looking into having a homeless shelter, but that, that's our future <laughs> goal planning. Uh, my second question about the legal immigrant help, you know, like I, you know, one of my community sister, I came to you maybe in a few years back, you know, like where her husband hold the passport, she won't go back, you know. So we went a lot of hassle, right? Yeah. So do you help any kind of yeah. those immigrant kind of thing? It's open. Yes, thank you, Salaam Thank you for the question. Uh, just so you generally know about NISA, we are a good resource to kind of direct you in the direction for legal services or therapy, but we as an organization don't necessarily provide legal services. You know, that that is really kind of what we really appreciate about MCC um, and our partners. What we do... Uh, People will come to us and they'll say, you know, uh, we are interested in meeting with a lawyer or needing a therapist in this area, and we'll direct you in those. We don't necessarily have in-house lawyers or therapists who would work with someone directly. Any other? A any more questions from anyone? Good question. So yes, um, we do reach um, work with our sister organizations around the Bay Area. So there is Narika, there is Maitri, there is SAFE, there is Family Justice System in Dublin, there is Arab um, Services for Women. So some uh, sometimes they are providing some services or workshops that we all kind of collaborate with each other. And we do send our sisters to those workshops, either it's financial or job related or resume making or how to search for homes. So we all, all of us work together for, uh, for the sisters or for the clients. Okay, we have a, a question online. Uh, it says, um, you mentioned men are also abused. Where do you house them? Is the question from online. Okay. 
Uh, we, do, we don't have actually space for men in our facilities. But you know, when people come to us, we are very resourceful in that we try to find spaces for them. You know, we, uh, Narika, they have an emergency motel program where they'll put someone up for a few days. And during that time, you'll be surprised at how many 10, 15 people within our organization are calling people to see how we can house them. So uh, we don't house men in the transitional home or the, or the shelter. Yeah. And just to sort of address the post, uh, once they've come into the shelter and, you know, we've set them up with services and then they've eventually transitioned into the transitional home, there's the whole healing process and the psychological uh, healing uh, of both the victim and her children family. So we do provide um, those sort of therapist services. Um, again, everything is outsourced, but we have such a collaborative network of affiliates, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists um, that are available to us, uh, mostly on a volunteer basis. And so we make sure that the uh, not only are they taken care of financially and physically, that their mental health and well-being is taken care of. Uh, so I have two parts question. The first being, uh, I was just reading the title, it says North American Islamic Shelter for the Abuse. So I'm assuming it's not just limited to uh, women and children, but go beyond that and men besides. So uh, is elder abuse part of this, uh, the service that you provide? Sorry if I didn't, if I missed that part. Um, so currently, given our resources, we're, you know, pretty much uh, catering towards women. And unfortunately, we have huge client list that we're serving but um, moving for uh, and just to also reiterate uh, we never turn a, a victim away a, a female victim what whatever ethnicity or denomination she is uh, we will make sure we'll take her in we tend to cater to to the Muslim community because they know us um, they see us in the mosques so those are more of the calls that we get in for help but um, in, in terms of elder abuse it is a conversation that we're having we, we see it in our community um, and uh, moving forward it's it's an aspiration that we're working we have had the, uh, a conversation on the board about how do we address elder issue um, and also domestic violence with men it, it's happening certainly um, and uh, this is, uh, we're hoping that these kind of co conversations in the masjids uh, will help us, you know, m move in that direction and, and raise funds and so that we can do services for others, for we, other members of our community. We have helped, uh, we've ha we've, we have helped someone who has experienced elder abuse before though. So that people do come with us, um, excuse me, come to us with that. And like I said, if, if the person who is coming to us doesn't kind of fit into the criteria of our shelter or transitional home, we have amazing resources in the community that we reach out to. I mean, when I, I've been tabling today, so I've had a chance to see a lot of you back there. And, you know, I've had three, four people come up to me, and right away I was able to say, okay, can you please get in touch with them? They need this service. And, and, and MCC has also been really great about that. So that's just something to keep in mind you know if they don't necessarily fit into the criteria of what we do we have a great way to direct them towards someone that can help do you have, oh, oh i'm so sorry so the the second part of my question is this services are provided from a reactive basis. So that is, so if somebody goes through that unfortunate incident or experience, then you, that is where Nisa comes in and helps the services. But how do we prevent such abuse to take place? How do we educate people so that they don't get into this situation at all? Great question. So, uh, so the, the, these events and these awareness is something that, that we, are, we try to do to bring to that and then um, I think the next um, lecture is about that also. And, uh, that's right. So that is a, a big part of our um, the goal. You know, it's not so much, you know, let's deal with it once it happens, but uh, a lot of education about what healthy relationships are. Like Imam Thayer just mentioned, we, uh, we hosted a marriage seminar where we had a therapist come from Southern California, and they hosted an entire weekend of people who were in marriages that you know, just were normal marriages and part of this, you know, 
different parts of the spectrum and they came and it was really to work on their relationships. It wasn't necessarily to heal any abuse that had happened. So we, we do try to kind of really be out there, promote healthy relationships, educate. Imam Thayer is going to do exactly that today, kind of tell you and and many of you, I'm sure, heard that today during the khutbah, just really kind of talk about what a healthy relationship is. So. Yes, yeah, so as Sister Manor mentioned, we do, we have had several preventative um, lectures and, and um, uh, workshops uh, where we address exactly this, you know, how do you prevent domestic violence? What, what are the factors that lead to domestic violence? Um, and to address those before the incident actually occurs. Um, and that, that's all about family harmony and, and unity. And um, we definitely uh, approach that in a very uh, aggressive way. Yeah, or just find examples of modeling what healthy relationships would look right. like in our different programs. So when somebody comes to you, so when somebody comes to you guys um, and says, you know, I've been uh, you know, been abused or whatnot, do you guys bring the man into the involved and try to like mediate between the two at all, or you guys just take it and just? Yeah, you know, it's sort of like an emergency sort of type situation. So you obviously want to have the victim safe. And so uh, we will make arrangements to bring the victim and her children, if there are children, to a safe house. Um, we won't engage. You know, our, our concern is um, stabilizing the victim, making sure they're okay. Um, if there are issues, obviously it's anonymous and it's confidential. The husband or the partner is not, you know, told where the, the victim is for safety reasons. Um, and that's what we do. If the victim decides she wants to go through dissolution of marriage or divorce proceedings, um, we will get an attorney involved um, who would deal with the partner. We, we do not directly um, uh, engage the abuser. And Samara can add to this because she works really closely with clients, but we, we can't really even advise the victim. You know, they come to us, tell us their circumstances, and you know, we, we couldn't reach out to her husband and say he should do or do that. Uh, I wouldn't say last resort, but I would say um, people come to us when, uh, yeah, last resort or their options are limited. And so, you know, um, but I know that Nadia is also, she had been talking, I don't know where she is about, uh, oh, sure. Assalamu alaikum. So I think people should know that even when we get a phone call on the hotline, we don't ever decide for them or give them advice on leaving their home. Uh, we only share with them uh, resources and what we can do and how we can help them. Ultimately, the decision has to be theirs and that's actually a legal requirement, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, so let alone the husband or the partner, we, we can't even advise the actual victim to you know, take any specific steps. But uh, Nadia, maybe you, uh, when you have a chance, you can talk about um, an organization to help uh, the, the male partner in these relationships, if you want to touch on it for a minute. So um, in Oakland, there is a restorative justice uh, organization called Men Creating Peace. It is really an organization where they provide um, therapy and intervention services to men who struggles with impulse control. Like, for example, if you find that you, you struggle with um, holding back your temper or you, you, are, you, you tend to use harsh words, um, you can contact them and they do have uh, sessions for men like that as well to cope with your... So the whole idea is to, to work on not getting you to the stage where um, the family breaks up, really. The idea is to do preventive measures or to even do restorative measures so that we restore the family harmony. And that's the goal of that organization. This is just a prime example of a resource that we would direct someone to if they needed that help. 